connected via Skype and all those who are connected via Facebook live streaming. Each one of you is welcome to this live broadcast. Zen Buddhism We know Zen We know what is Buddhism Buddhism is the fragrance of Gautam the Buddha It developed and flourished in India. Around the same time there was Lao Tse in China and Tao emerged. Zen goes beyond Buddhism and Tao of Lao Tse too. Tao evolved in China as the fragrance of Lao Tse, the wise old man who lived was a contemporary of the Chinese philosopher although Zen goes beyond both Buddha and Lao Tse but Zen is just Zen there is nothing comparable to it it is unique unique in the sense that it is most ordinary and yet most extraordinary phenomena that has happened to human consciousness. Sufism evolved and developed in the deserts of Middle East where miles and miles of desert only a few green spots were found. As a result, it developed differently. It is a path full of the opposite of the desert, the greenery, the love evolved out of heart. Zen grew up in China and Japan so it is purely meditative insights. It is the most ordinary because it does not believe in knowledge and the mind either. It is neither a philosophy nor a religion either. There is a particular incident comes and it is worth mentioning the comment, the dialogue of the person who was working. During Mahabharat, there was an episode comes in when Duryodhan and his friends have conspired to kill Pandavas so they can keep them deprived and capture the entire kingdom for themselves so made a castle of wax and it was arranged to set the fire it will be considered an accident 
that all the five Pandavas along with the mother burnt into burnt to ashes. It was discovered. They had to be brought out of that palace safe and at the same time nobody should know and the conspirators will consider it that their plan succeeded and the five brothers and the mother burnt into ashes. So the minister who had a particular liking towards the Pandavas for their sincerity and the sense of the truth, he discovered of this plan so he hired some people to dig a grave, dig a kind of a tunnel that will start from a place in the palace, the wax palace, and it will take them safe to another place. So the work started from the two ends, from the palace as well as from the they have a short period of time. So one of the person who was engaged in digging, he happened to encounter one of the Pandava prince. So instead of he continued to do his work without paying any attention to Pandava prince, but the Pandava prince found it was a great insult to him. He said, you did not pay me respect. He said, I am not here to pay respect or anything to you. I am here to do my work. My work is, I have been assigned the responsibility of completing the job of digging this tunnel so that you all could be brought out safe and I have no time to respect anyone, to take notice of anyone or anything. This statement is very significant. This is the essence of Zen. Zen is, does not, Zen does not concern whether whatever the Zen master is saying appeals to your heart or hurts your ego or not, it does not matter very blunt, straightforward mathematics, no emotions, no feelings, nothing of that sort. And so this is how Zen is very ordinary and yet very extraordinary. There was a Zen master and any time he would say anything, he will point the finger. So there was a little boy who was entered the monastery as a little boy. So any time the master will show his finger, he will imitate and show the finger as well. So one day it happened as the little boy showed the finger thinking that this would have been a gesture of meditation innocently the master took the knife and chopped out his finger. As he did it he became enlightened. Because it came as a sudden shock, Zen believe in that way. Zen is acceptance of the ordinary existence with a total heart, with one's total being, not desiring the other world, the supramundane 
or supramental. It has no interest in any esoteric nonsense, unlike the other religious paths. No interest in any esoteric nonsense or in metaphysics at all. It does not hanker for the other shore. This shore is more than enough and its acceptance of this shore is so tremendous that through that very acceptance alone it transforms this shore and then this very shore becomes the other shore. Once it is transformed, now how can you understand this? He has a piece of gold that has been just extracted from the mine. It is full of impurities and it pure, full of impurities. So what does the goldsmith does? He puts it into the furnace and with that of course put it in his own way of doing the work. So with at that high temperature the impurities burn then give it the shape. And when it comes out of the furnace and finished in the processing in the workshop, it becomes pure. It's not that these two are different. If we call that just mind piece of gold, which is full of impurities as one shore, and this other shore, so there is no other shore. It is the same shore that was, same piece of gold that was full of impurities as it was extracted from the mine and when it has gone through the process, its impurities burned, it is now pure form. This is the way of Zen. There is no need to talk about the other shore or anything. Just continue to work assiduously to purify this. This is a simple process. No metaphysics is needed. There is a process of purifying the gold at a certain temperature. It is put in the furnace and all the impurities burned and the moment impurities are burned it attains to a new shape and look. So through this very acceptance of this shore the other shore becomes possible to get. This very body becomes the Buddha and this very earth becomes the lotus paradise. Therefore it is ordinary. It does not want you to create a certain kind of a spirituality or a certain kind of holiness. There is, when Sikhs dress in a particular way, everyone dress in a particular way as if dress is something else. Buddhist on the full moon night sit under the Bodhi tree in a lotus posture, eat the porridge made out of rice and milk and they consider by these things 
they can attain to enlightenment. These are all ignorance. Enlightenment happens when it is just like boiling the water. The moment the temperature of the water reaches 100 degrees Celsius, it begins to boil. It does not have to say its prayers. It does not have to do anything else. The water does not eat the sweet rice as Buddha did or anything of that nature. Zen consider this all as a stupidity. It is not needed. All that it asks is that you live your life with a spontaneity. A spontaneity is the way of spirituality. And then the mundane becomes the sacred. What is the way that impure gold becomes pure? A simple process, no prayers, nothing of that, no ritual. Simply, it is a scientific process. It is put in the fire. The impurity is burnt and you attain to pure piece of gold with 100% purity, 24 carats. So when the life is lived in a spontaneity, a great miracle happens. The mundane becomes the sacred. The great miracle of Zen is in the transformation of mundane into the sacred, the baser into the precious. And it is tremendously extraordinary because this way life has never been approached before. And this way life has never been respected either. Zen goes beyond Buddha and beyond Lao Tse as well. It is a culmination, a transcendence of both the Indian genius and that of the Chinese. The Indian genius reached its highest peak in Gautam the Buddha and Chinese genius reached its highest peak in Lao Tse. And the meeting is the essence of Buddha's teaching and the essence of the teaching of Lao Tse. Both merge into one stream so deeply that there is no separation possible now. Even to make a distinction between what belongs to Buddha and what belongs to Lao Tse is impossible. You cannot separate the two. The merger has been so total that there is no possibility of any distinction. It is not only a synthesis. There is a difference between synthesis and integration. Zen is integration of Buddhism and Taoism, a Taoist way. Taoist is the way of Lao Tse. Out of this integration, the meeting, Zen is born. Zen is neither Buddhist nor Taoist, it is both. When the two are integrated into one another, it is very difficult to separate when you are making a sugar solution this sugar is melted into water the water is no more water the sugar is no more sugar because two of them lose their normal presence 
normal existence. They, there comes in place a homogeneous solution. To call Zen Zen Buddhism is not right, but we do call that. To call Zen Zen Buddhism is not right because it is far more than that. Buddha does not belong to the earth the way Zen does. Zen is very down to earth. Lao Tse is tremendously earthly and Zen is not only earthly, it is Zen vision that transforms the earth into heaven, the baser into precious. Lao Tse is earthly, Buddha is unearthly, and Zen is both, it is being both, it has become the most extraordinary phenomenon. It is integration of both the earth and non-earthly element. The future of humanity will go closer and closer to the approach of Zen because the meeting of the East and West is possible only through Zen, which is earthly and not, and yet unearthly. The West is very earthly and East is very unearthly. Who is going to become the bridge? And unless this bridge is established, there is an inner discipline and there is an outer discipline. Both are separate phenomena. What bridges the two is the meditation. Buddha cannot be the bridge. He is so essentially Eastern in his approach that the very flavor and the very fragrance of the East remains uncompromising through Buddha. Lao Tse cannot be the bridge because he is too earthly. China has always been very earthly. China is more part of the Western psyche than of the Eastern psyche. So what is going to be the bridge? It is not an accident that China is the first country in the East to turn communist, to become materialist, to believe in a godless philosophy and to believe that man is only matter and nothing else. This is not just accidental. China has been earthly for almost 5,000 years. It's very Western. Hence, Lao Tse cannot become the bridge. He is more like Zorba the Greek. Zorba the Greek was a novel written by Kazan Zaki, a Greek writer. It's a very small book. In that, there is a person who is completely materialistic. He goes he is sent to the town, he spends out all his money in merrymaking, enjoyment in everything. Hence, this is the life of each one of you. You are like Zorba, who likes, the, this is how the journey begins. You, your life is that of the outer. That is what you have known. They eat, drink, dancing and merrymaking. You have not known anything of the inner world. And it is out of this individual who, is, who was once engaged in this kind of merrymaking when the transformation happens, he turned out to be a Buddha. So, Zorba the Buddha. But the 
basic novel written by Kazanzaki was Zorba the Greek. Osho had transformed into Zorba the Buddha. Buddha is so unearthly that you cannot even catch hold of him. Therefore he cannot become the bridge. Indeed, Zen seems to be the only possibility. Because in Zen, Buddha and Lao Tse has become one. The meeting has already happened. The seed is there. The seed is that of great bridge which can make the East and West one. Zen is going to be the meeting point. It is a great future, a great past. And the miracle is that Zen is neither interested in the past nor in future. It is total. It's total interest in this very moment. Maybe that is why the miracle is possible. Because the past and future are bridged by the present. If you have to move from the past to the present, you have to use the bridge. The present is not part of time. Have you ever thought about it? How long is the present? Past has a duration, the future has a duration. duration. What is the duration of the present? How long does it last? Between the past and the future you can only measure the present. It is immeasurable and it is almost not. It is not an aspect of time. It is instant penetration of eternity in time. When the unknown and unknowable enters the time, it becomes the present moment. Time becomes still. The present moment is eternal. The eternity has entered into time. And the moment eternity enters into time, it becomes present moment. Indeed, Zen lives in the present. The whole teaching is how to be present, how to get out of the past which is no more, and how not to get involved in the future which is again not yet, and just to be re rooted centered in that which is, which is in front of our eyes. The whole approach of Zen is of immediacy and because of that it can bridge both the past and the future. It can bridge many things. It can bridge the past and the future. It is a metaphor to use where the bridging is necessary. It can bridge east and west. It can bridge the body and the soul. It can bridge the unbridgeable worlds. This world and that. The mundane and the sacred. This is the way of Zen. We'll continue on this in subsequent sessions. Until then, take care and do have a blessing.